Welcome to Built to Go, a van life podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Wagg, coming to you from the College of Curiosity and Antarctica again. Well, actually, it's not entirely true. This is episode two of Antarctica, uh, which I promised you, and I will explain everything. But folks, if you're new to this show, if this is your first time listening, don't listen to this one first. I mean, you can, but it won't make much sense. Go back a few episodes and you'll know why we're talking about Antarctica on a van life channel. <laughs> so, very first thing we have to talk about. Uh, yeah, that was an unmitigated, complete disaster. No, not the trip to Antarctica. My uploading of the first episode of the Antarctica episodes. And I, I apologize. Uh, any of you who tried to listen, thank you. I hope some of you were successful. I had I just incredible problems getting that file up. And the file that finally went up was an M4A, which is a fine file format, but it doesn't work on Spotify. So if you were one of those people who uses Spotify and couldn't listen... That episode is now available. What I did was I re-uploaded it exactly the same, except as an MP3, and that should work with Spotify. It reset my download counts and messed up my stats, but I don't care. <laughs> I would much rather have a working episode up there. I also have to thank you for your patience. I am back home. I am in Chicago. I've been here now for a few days. I, I got back on Thanksgiving, and it has taken me quite a while to uh, get back to normal. And there's, there's a number of reasons for that that will come out over the few days. But know that everything's fine. It's all good. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about my trip. And then next week, or actually tomorrow, I will be back to normal and release a regular episode. So that's where we're at. So when you last left me, I had just visited Antarctica. And I had just visited my first spot in Antarctica. We actually kept going, of course. We had four days in Antarctica, and we went to a bunch of different places. And we saw a variety of things. One of the first things we did was we sailed around and saw the ice. And that was actually my favorite thing to do. To be in the zodiacs and cruise along the ice. And just the water is so clear there. I mean, it's full of food, but apparently... There's not a lot of plankton. I don't quite understand how this works because krill is what makes everything work down there. Everything eats krill and then other things eat some of the things that eat krill and that's how it works. But there just isn't that much plankton. And when there's not much plankton in the water, the water's very clear. So as we're cruising along in our zodiacs, we can actually look down and see the bottom. And it, it's all round rocks. I mean, uh, it's another planet. It very, very much feels like another planet, and I absolutely loved it. Now, we never went to any civilized place. If you are on my Facebook or whatever and you see some pictures, you may see buildings in a lot of my pictures because we did visit places with buildings, but we didn't go to any of the buildings. And in fact, there was nobody in the buildings, so it didn't matter. The ship crew was a little bit worried about COVID still, and given what's going on on other ships right now, I don't blame them. We would have normally had an open bridge where the door was open and we could go onto the bridge anytime we wanted and talk to the captain and see all the equipment and stuff. But because of fear of COVID, that was closed. In fact, we didn't get to tour any of the ship at all. Not the kitchen, not the engine room, which is pretty rare, and, and not the bridge, which was, which was disappointing. We did get to meet the captain a couple of times, but it wasn't normal. There's crew and staff. We have to understand this. The crew is attached to the ship. It doesn't matter who has chartered it, the crew runs the ship. And they were all wearing masks the entire trip. The staff, mm, not so much. And, uh, and the passengers, absolutely not. I mean, I wore a mask some of the time. They asked us to wear masks around the buffet, and I did that, but that was about it. And uh, you know what happened? Nobody got COVID, apparently, because nobody was tested. But <laughs> a lot of people got sick. Uh, was it COVID? Mm, I don't know. I actually tested myself because I had symptoms of a cold and I didn't have COVID. I had a cold. But it, people, some people were so sick that they couldn't get off the ship. And, that, and that's a shame. They, they went all the way down there and, and basically had to stay in their cabin the whole time. And, you know, it's the chances you take with anything like this. So... I feel bad for them. But I got to do the whole thing. Uh, it was a successful trip for me. I saw lots and lots and lots of penguins. Now, a little bit more about the penguins. So we saw three kinds of penguins. 
we saw you can look these up if you want we we saw gentoos which is g-e-n-t-o-o we saw adelis which are one of only two species of penguin that never leaves antarctica they they stay and breed and they're always in antarctica which is kind of cool and we saw chin straps which are so well named because when you look at these penguins they look like they have a chin strap like a helmet on it, it's it's striking there's no other bird or animal i know of that has this particular marking Everybody can identify a chin strap. The others can be a little trickier. Now, when we were in the more southerly areas like Mickelson Harbor and, and Sierra Cove and places like that, there, there were plenty of penguins. I mean, there, there are penguins everywhere. You will have no problem seeing penguins, I promise you. But what the penguins were doing is interesting. The further south penguins were just getting started mating. In fact, we would see that fairly common, that the penguins would mate. I mean, you know, uh, bow, chicka, wow, wow, they're there. That takes about 10 seconds and slam, bam, thank you, ma'am, however that goes. Yeah, but that, 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 yeah, that's, that's life in the big Antarctica. As we got further north, they were kind of done with mating and they started to make nests. And at our last stop, which was Deception Island, and I'll talk about more, more about that in a minute, the penguins uh, were laying eggs. And the difference between these is simply temperature. As we got further north, it got warmer and warmer, and that is what affects the breeding season. So even though it was the same species of penguins on Deception Island as there were in Mickelson Harbor, a little bit, there were a few chin straps there, but a lot of chin straps on Deception Island, they were totally different breeding schedules, which is interesting. So I was disappointed we didn't actually get to go to Port Lock. Roy or any of the places that had people. We couldn't send postcards from Antarctica, which I had hoped to do. But I mean, how disappointed can you be? It's Antarctica. And we would go ashore or in a ride twice a day. We saw all kinds of ice. And some people got to snowshoe to the top of mountains. Other people got to kayak. Uh, I found myself liking the Zamboni a whole lot, although I did spend a significant time of shore. And it was, it was absolutely wonderful. And one thing I didn't expect was to make friends. I mean, I wasn't trying not to make friends. I wasn't hiding or anything, but I didn't go there to make friends. And I, I am kind of a loner. I mean, I've been doing this van life uh, podcast now for a few years, and I've never met any of you. <laughs> That's kind of weird. Uh, but that doesn't mean I'm antisocial and don't like people. I do. And on this trip, I ended up with this group of friends, and we called ourselves the fake Canadians. <laughs> There's a story behind that that I'm not going to tell you, but uh, the way it worked is I decided I was going to sit in the same seat at every meal and just see what happened. And I figured people would rotate through and I'd get to meet different people. But by the third or fourth day, the same people kept coming to that table. And finally, by the last night, that was our table. There were six of us. This was our table. It was pretty clear. We ate all our meals together. And now we're all Facebook friends and we talk daily. And that's kind of nice. And it's, it's people from all over the U.S. and one woman from Lithuania. And it was really uh, nice to have people to travel with and, and actually similarly minded people. One really interesting thing was how like minded everybody was on this trip. We were all people willing to sacrifice a good amount of money and a lot of comfort to go to Antarctica. And I think that filters out a lot of people. I've been on a lot of cruises. These were not the kind of people that normally go on cruises. In fact, I talked to a lot of them and this was the first time they'd ever been on a boat. That's pretty interesting. And, and for a couple of them, it was the first time they'd ever seen snow. And boy, did we see snow. The snow was six, seven, eight feet in some places. So that's pretty cool. Now, our, our trip was, you know, coming to a close. Now, that, that's to say our trip in Antarctica was coming to a close. We still had to get back to Ushuaia. And on the third night in Antarctica of four nights, we had a special meeting upstairs. And our guide, our head guide, whose name was Hadley, who's a fascinating guy, uh, had like basically lives in Antarctica, knows everything, told us that we had a little bit of a problem. And that problem was that... He was looking at the weather maps, and there was an enormous storm coming right through the Drake Passage, which, of course, isn't uncommon. But sometimes these storms are so bad that the ship can't leave. Like, in some cases, the ship has had to stay in Antarctica five extra days. 
And uh, obviously that's a problem. Now, we had provisions for that. The ship had 45 days worth of fuel for a 10-day trip. Obviously, we had a lot more food. In fact, every time we went ashore, they brought enough food and tents and stuff for us to live for several days. So even if we had to, we, we could do that. So there wasn't any risk like that. It was just a matter of time. And of course, it would screw up the next cruise because those people would be getting on just as we got off. But he noticed in the weather patterns that there was kind of this lull and there was another storm coming. And he plotted out a route that would let us see some stuff in the morning, but we'd have to skip the afternoon and then start heading back. But doing so would let us get back. We'd kind of dodge the storms. And so, you know, we didn't have any say in the matter. We're like, okay, boss, that's what we're going to do then, huh? And we did. And what was cool about it is we got to go to a place that I've actually always wanted to go my whole life. And that is Deception Island. I mean, how can you not want to go to a place named Deception Island? You know, I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's just too cool. And you can Google this. Deception Island is an interesting place. There's all kinds of legends about why it's called Deception Island, but I think they're all crap. I think the reason it's called Deception Island is pretty obvious. If you look at the island from above, it's a crescent. It's this very, very large crescent-shaped island with water in the middle and only this tiny little gap to get inside. So you would think it was just one big solid island if you were sailing by, if you didn't know about the gap. And I think that's the deception. Other people have said the deception is that when you go through that gap, you're entering a place called Neptune's Bellows because there's so much wind there that it's surprising. There's actually more wind in that little path passage to the inside of the island than there is out at open sea and that's not how it usually works usually when you get close to the island the wind dies down but not here so maybe that's where the name comes from but if you look at it on a map you'll see wow that's really weird and it's weird because it's a volcano it's a volcano that erupted and on during one eruption it blew part of its cinder cone out um you know so it's a caldera that's like the big open area inside a volcano and the cinder cone is like the mountains around that and one of those edges broke off leaving these amazing structures there called bailey's head which we spent a lot of time at and it made a little passageway into the water and the ocean filled up the caldera and created a really nice natural harbor, and it's been used by people for now 200 years, which is a long time for that region. And what's on this island, and the first thing we did actually before we went inside is we went on the island, and there's 100,000 breeding pairs, pairs of chinstrap penguins there. And we went up and walked around them and watched them swim in glacial streams and... No, they weren't flying. That's the only thing they didn't do. But we saw everything else. And these penguins were laying eggs. So we saw them carrying stones and making their nests, and stealing stones from each other. And yeah, we saw some of the more gruesome parts of nature. There were some dead penguins and there were skuas flying around stealing eggs and eating them and, you know, stuff like that. Some people saw some seals, uh, that, but I didn't see them. And, and you know, it doesn't matter. It was, it was just amazing to be around that many penguins. And the penguins climb mountains. I know I've said that before, but <laughs> some of these mountains are hundreds and hundreds of feet high. And if you look up top with binoculars, you see penguins. It's penguins all the way up. Anyway. That was our morning, and it was a very, very rough landing. The Zodiacs had to time their landings between the waves. So there's big waves crashing, like kind of like Hawaii waves, you know? And basically a wave would crash, and then the Zodiac would come in behind the wave and then try to ride it onto the beach. And then we'd all rush out, and then the crew were standing in the water wearing dry suits, and they'd push the boat back out. We had a couple little incidents, nothing serious, nobody fell in the water, but it was definitely the most dangerous thing we did. And they told us that. They, they warned us that the, this, is, this is as sketchy as we're going to get. Anyway, after we all enjoyed that, we got back on the boat and then we sailed inside the volcano and we went into a place in there called Whaler's Bay and uh, guess what they did in Whaler's Bay? 
Yeah, that's where the whalers went. Isn't that amazing that it's named the same thing? So whalers loved this little bay because it was so isolated, and they actually built up a big processing plant there. And it's still there. I mean, there's these giant oil tanks. It's this big industrial ruin with broken ships and tanks and wooden structures and an airplane hangar, which happens to be where the first flight in Antarctica took off from. And we just sailed around there. Now, sometimes they go ashore there, but we didn't because we were in a rush. And it was okay. We were, we were happy to see it from the boat. And then, as we sailed back through Neptune's bellows and, and waved goodbye to the land, we made our mad dash for Ushuaia. And we got our asses kicked. So we did actually skirt the storms, but that doesn't mean it was easy. Uh, it, it was the roughest I have ever seen on any water anywhere. Once we sailed out of Neptune's bellows and we had a couple hours to get relax, and then we had our last night in Antarctica toast, <laughs> there must have been 50 broken champagne glasses from them falling over. Down in the dining room, they took off the tablecloths and they covered the tables in like this sticky, rubbery stuff, which would be really good in vans. <laughs> I should have asked them where they got it from. And uh, that kind of helped keep things on the table from falling. But man, it was super rough. And at night, you kind of had to hold on to the bed, else you'd fall out. Because even though they were sort of bunk beds, it didn't have a railing on the bottom. I learned to kind of sleep with the rhythm of the boat. And, and mentally, I turned it into a rocking, like in a hammock. And that helped me not get sick. But on the way back, I did have a couple mad dashes for the bathroom in the morning. Because I, I tried to do the way home without the patch. I thought, ah, I'm tough now. I'm a, a seasoned Antarctica old salt. I don't need this silly anti-nausea, excuse me. <clears throat> and yeah, I put the patch on and that was better. So I, if you're someone who gets seasick uh, or motion sick, I can definitely tell you the patches work. They affected people differently. For me, the patches made me mildly queasy, but they kept me at mildly queasy, and that was it. So, But I, it was better than anything else, but I still didn't feel great, and I was very happy to take the patch off at the end. Finally, on the last night, we sailed into the Beagle Channel, which, if you look at a map, is a big, wide area that ships can go through at the bottom of South America that shields them from the Drake Passage. And that was beautiful. There was this amazing sunset, and this albatross was flying right next to the ship, and it was, it was like, hey, welcome home. And everybody was super high, uh, just naturally. I did not see any substances around. And it was wonderful. We all bonded that moment. We, we just had the greatest trip ever. I really wish my wife could have joined me. And I wish you guys could have too. I wish I could share what I went through with all of you because it was absolutely worth it. And I'm totally ready to go back. I'd rather not do the Drake Passage again. And you don't, you don't have to. You can fly down there. And you can also do it on a bigger ship that will handle it better. But uh, I don't know. <laughs> it costs a lot of money to fly and there's issues with like sometimes the planes can't land and stuff like that so i don't know we'll see if i do charter the ship which has been talked about um the, the company contacted me and asked me if i wanted to charter this ship i'll let you know and if i do i will try to make it as affordable as possible and everything but i would need to get 65 67 people to go and that's kind of a big lift for me so i don't know if we're gonna do that but Anyway, I will probably do a trip to Antarctica. I'll definitely let you know. It might be on a big ship that doesn't actually go ashore. Anyway, uh, after that, we hiked in Ushuaia, and I went to Uruguay, and I'll, I'll talk more about that on the podcast because I can incorporate that stuff into van life, unlike sailing to Antarctica. So I, I feel like a different person now. Uh, my perspective on things has changed quite a bit, and uh, I've now seen all seven continents, which you can put on my tombstone or something. I don't know what good that is, but, but it's true. I have, and I feel fulfilled as a traveler, despite the fact that, uh, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm going to get on another ship on Saturday and go to the Caribbean on a big, huge, fancy cruise ship, uh, which is a completely different experience, but that's because my wife needs a vacation and she deserves it. And I'm going to support that. So folks, thanks very much for listening to the Antarctica stuff. If, if you are really curious about it, I am writing a very detailed travel log 
about this on medium.com and you can go to medium.com and search for my name jeff wag and it will come up it's very detailed uh, this is long form writing each article takes 15 20 minutes to read and there's pictures and stuff but if you are really curious about what it's like to get to antarctica and what the experience is like it has a lot more information than the podcast so anyway Thank you all. Back to our regularly scheduled recordings starting tomorrow.